Good evening. I'm Mark Uptegrove, the director of the LBJ Presidential Library. And on behalf of the Texas Tribune, our co-sponsor for tonight's event, I want to welcome you. Our capacity crowd here, or the rain has, I think, prevented a few people from showing, but I can tell you we turned down about 200 people to this event. But that bears testament to the excitement around our guests tonight, Joaquin and Julian Castro, rising stars in Texas politics. But theirs is a truly American story. Born in San Antonio, second-generation Mexican-Americans, Joaquin and Julian were raised on the city's west side and grew up beneficiaries of their parents' tireless work and sacrifices for their future. In turn, both the Castro brothers have shown a deep commitment to the American political process and to public service. Joaquin Castro served five terms as a state representative from his home city, and last year was elected to the United States Congress, where he serves on the House Armed Service Committee and the Foreign Affairs Committee. Julian Castro serves as the mayor of San Antonio and at 38 is the youngest mayor of any major American city. Last summer, he became a national figure when President Obama tapped him to deliver the keynote address at the Democratic National Convention, a spotlight he shared with his brother. Joaquin and Julian Castro have often be call, been called the future of the Democratic Party, but in so many ways, they represent the future of our state and of our country at large. Moderating tonight's discussion with the Castro brothers is the founder and CEO of the Texas Tribune, the former editor of Texas Monthly, and a good friend of the LBJ Presidential Library, Evan Smith. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Joaquin Castro, Julian Castro, and Evan Smith. Mayor? All right. Congressman? Mark, thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. Gentlemen, Mayor, Congressman, thank Good you very much you. for being here. Great to be here. Since we are in President Johnson's house, it seems fitting that we talk about Medicaid first. Uh, <laughs> Absolutely. Is that okay? We just get right into it? No, no dressing up? Let's just get started. I'm going to uh, need some water for this. You may. <laughs> you may. So there you both were yesterday uh, at a press event that was called, uh, not so much a rebuttal, but maybe a, uh, a parry and thrust, let's call it that, uh, with uh, Governor, Governor Perry, Senator Cruz, Senator Cornyn. They announced uh, uh, last week that they would get together on Monday at the Capitol and redouble their efforts to keep Texas from expanding Medicaid. You all decided to come to Austin and take the opposite position. Yeah. Mr. Mayor, why, why do that? and explain, please, your position on this. Yeah, well, thanks for the question, and thank you all very much for having us here. It's great to be here at the LBJ Library. Uh, I felt compelled to do it because uh, it's such an important issue to the health of Texas families, and I felt as though there needed to be as powerful a counterpoint to the argument that, uh, that Perry, Cruz, and Cornyn were making about not accepting a Medicaid expansion. Uh, I, yesterday, I talked about in San Antonio that we see uh, just person after person uh, who calls the ambulance because the emergency room is their primary care physician because they don't have health insurance and they wait and they wait until something catastrophic happens and then the taxpayers get stuck with the bill uh, because they don't pay their ambulance bill, they don't have the money. So we literally have tens of millions of dollars in San Antonio like most cities do of unpaid ambulance fees right. and, uh, and that's just from my local perspective. Uh, I believe that this is such an important issue for the health of Texas families that Joaquin and I talked that day that, that uh, we saw that they were going to be having their press conference and said, why not? Just counter what they, yeah. counter oh, what they absolutely. say. Oh, absolutely. And yeah. I, think, I think, Evan, it's the moral and economic right thing to do. Um, you know, morally, uh, we've got to remember that these are human beings, many of whom are suffering without health care. Yeah. Uh, and as we on mentioned, the only time they get to see the doctor is when they go to the emergency room uh, but, but even if you're not soft-hearted, so to speak, uh, even if it's just about dollars and cents, that's the reason that the Chambers of Commerce, uh, the Hospital Association, doctors have all come out to put pressure on the governor uh, to accept Medicaid expansion uh, because the state, if we don't do it, first of all, as, as taxpayers, that money is already going to Washington. Yeah. The question is, are we going to take it back? 
or are we going to let it go to California or other states? And so we would be giving up somewhere close to $100 billion uh, by not accepting this money. Right. And so, you know, for those reasons and others, we wanted to make that point in Austin. Co Congressman, no one uh, disputes the magnitude of the problem. We're talking about, at last count, 28.8% of the population in Texas right. is uninsured, doesn't count the underinsured or the underserved, just the uninsured. 6.2 million of our now 26.5 million citizens have no insurance. But what the governor and Senators Cruz and Cornyn would say is, yes, it is our money. And it should come back to Texas not with strings attached. It should come back in a block grant. It should allow the state of Texas, which knows better on many subjects, to assert that knowledge. We have a way we could fix this. We don't need them to tell us what to do. Give us our money back, and we'll fix the problem, Congressman. Why not? Well, I would say a few things. Um, well, first, I think they understand that a block grant, and a block grant would simply say that instead of any guidelines from the federal government, you would simply turn over $100 billion to Rick Perry uh, and the Republican leadership and let them do what they want. Good luck. Uh, yeah, I mean, good luck with that, right? Uh, I mean, the fact is, uh, if you look at what happened, for those who have a memory of 10 years ago, that was my first legislative session. In 2003, the legislature passed a bill called House Bill 2292, where they essentially tried to privatize different services related to health care, including CHIP. Uh, and uh, that was a disaster. And I think it ended up costing the state $150 million or somewhere around that total. The big efforts were made in subsequent sessions, Congressman, to put some of that money and some of those kids back into the system. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. No, yeah. Uh, you know, as the budgets got better, then they tried to, to remedy that. Right. But there was, an, there was a, an attempt at privatization of some of those functions, essentially, that went awry. Right. Uh, and so on that score and on TANF, some of the TANF issues, uh, the governor has not shown that he's the best steward of some of this money. Uh, you know, and, not to, and, and then you've also got uh, what's gone on with, with CIPRIT, uh, not wanting something as basic as an audit about how money is being spent. So there's real questions about simply turning that money over. You worry whether we're capable of spending that money in a way that we oh, should? Oh, sure. With, with right. these group of leaders, I am, quite frankly. Right. And just look at the Mayor. track record. I mean, you know, uh, Governor Perry has been in office since 2000. Uh, and you have more uninsured Texans now than back then. Uh, I believe you have a higher percentage of uninsured Texans Of course, you now. have more Texans back then. In fairness, Mr. Mayor, there was a problem in the Bush years as governor and even in the Richards years that we had a very high percentage of our citizens uninsured. It's not a sure. new problem. It's not yeah. a Rick Perry problem sure. necessarily. Yeah, sure. but, you know, the issue is, as, as uh, Justice Rehnquist used to say, that you have to take the bitter with the sweet. So the, the you know, the narrative that uh, that... Uh, these folks spin out is of Texas as this shining star for economic development, but don't want to own up to the fact that things have gotten worse or at least haven't gotten better on all of these indicators that will foretell how well Texas is going to compete in the 21st century global economy. Yeah, I want to come back to some of those other issues. Let me stay on health care for a second and ask you about another objection that Governor Perry and the senators have raised, and that is that this money is not forever. There's going to be a time when this money will run out and the costs of insuring those people will come back to the state. It will be billions of dollars. We know that even in what we're told now are good times, it's still a pretty austere budget, low tax, low service. Do we really even have the money yeah. to incorporate those people back onto our budget when the federal money runs out? What about that? Well, it's estimated that over the next 10 years that the expenditure by the federal government would be about $90 billion and, yeah. and by the state government would be just over $15 billion. Right. That's over a 10-year period. To give you a sense, and I know that you know very well, but to give folks a sense of that, I mean, we have, what, about 10 or 11 million sitting yeah, in a surplus? Somewhere and between $8 and $10 billion in the rainy day fund right now, right. Yeah. never mind what you might have in five years or so. And then you've also got an $8 billion surplus or so. You know, so you've got a surplus and a rainy day fund combined. Of course, we seem to have spent that money in the rainy day fund and the surplus about 10 times since January 1st. <laughs> Right, I'm not sure that the money would be freely available, but I, I grant your point. Well, Good which, economic times sure. ought to make it possible yeah. for us to pay these, also, these which, costs. Also, which gets to an underlying point here. Yeah. It's all about priorities. What do you make a priority of the state? Right. And, and basically, you know, he has been deprioritizing investments that are important so that you can have healthy families in the state of Texas. Give me an example of a, of a priority that he has said, we don't need to do this. Uh, and that's in turn exacerbated sure. the problem. Uh, let me give you an example from our experience in San Antonio. In San Antonio in, in November, uh, the voters passed 
pre-K for SA, a one-eighth cent sales tax initiative to ensure that we significantly expand high-quality full-day pre-K. Well, there was a Republican legislator, Diane Patrick. Uh, Diane Patrick, that in the 2009 session got bipartisan support to significantly expand pre-kindergarten education in right. Texas, and that was vetoed by the governor. So basically, you're telling the, the school children of Texas, these four-year-olds, uh, those families, no, you're not important enough. But yeah. when it comes to spending on prisons or whatever else he wants to spend on, then yeah, let's it's do it. a question of priorities. Or, or yeah. uh, just, just to put a, a yeah. point on it, the other day uh, when he said after sequestration affected small airfields so that they wouldn't have a full-time air traffic controller, he said, you know what? Let's, let's step in and pay for that. So your argument is if he could find the money for that, he should be finding oh, the money sure. for this. Yeah. Uh, Congressman, people will also say that the Medicaid system is broken. Why mm -hmm. would you put more people into a system that is not working, one in which doctors and hospitals are actually reluctant to take new Medicaid patients because the reimbursements are inadequate? Sure. People say that the thing needs to be blown up and rebuilt, yeah. not add sure. people to a system that's already not working. What well, about that? Well, uh, let me answer that directly in a second. But first, some context on, on, in terms of why you would take the money. Uh, even the safest play, the most conservative play, would essentially to be to, to, to do what Jan Brewer and Rick Scott and Chris Christie have done. Republican governors. That's right, Republican, right. Governors, Republican governors in other states, yeah. which is say, look, this program is 100% paid for by the federal government through 2016. We as a state don't start paying anything. I think at that point they pay about five cents on the dollar that right. first year. Uh, we don't pay anything until then. So if the federal government somehow backs out of its commitment during that time, then we're gonna dump the program. Yeah. So that would be the easiest thing to do. That's the safest play for this governor, but he's refusing to do even that. Right. Part of the reason he's refusing to do that is because of the argument that you bring up system about the system being broken. Right. Uh, a few things on that. The first thing, it's the states and not the federal government that manage Medicaid. Uh, but very specifically, and to the heart of the debate, they set the reimbursement rates for providers who decide either to join or not join, in other words, accept Medicaid patients or not accept them. Yeah. So they have essentially created their own self-fulfilling prophecy by lowering reimbursement rates, right. not keeping them competitive with what private insurance And also offers. lowering the eligibility rates in terms of That's the right. percentage of income that you right. can have with so, federal poverty. So then they turn around and complain yeah. the system's right. broken, but maybe sure. they broke it. Sure, absolutely. I mean, right. And I wouldn't say that it's broken. I would say that it needs improvement. But the other part of that is the money that we're going to draw down from the federal government right. will then allow you to go increase those rates and also fix the system uh, as it stands now. So you, know, you see them do this not only with health care, but also on issues like public education, right. where they start to starve the schools, and then when the schools don't perform, they say, well, look, look how bad the schools are. You need vouchers. Uh, and so there's this, this, this shell game that they seem to play with all of these things. Right. Let me... Uh let me go to public education, Mr. Mayor. You brought up the initiative that passed on the ballot in November. Very brave uh, these days, especially in a state like Texas, to be publicly in favor of a tax increase. In fact, putting your personal and political capital behind raising taxes. Sure. But on the other hand, you gave the voters of your community the opportunity to do thumbs up or thumbs down. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, well... Um I mean, the whole reason that, that I got into politics in the first place was because I got excited when I went away from San Antonio about what San Antonio could be. And I felt, uh, we both felt very blessed with the opportunities that we had in life and recognized that more folks in San Antonio should have those opportunities. So when I became mayor, I mean, before I became mayor, tackling the issue of educational achievement, which I see as the primary issue to that yep. city's advancement, uh, I had to do it. You know, I, I can be. I couldn't be happy doing the potholes and the you know somebody's barking dog and all that stuff. You know, I mean, yeah, that's leave, part leave of the that, job. Leave that to Cory Booker, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, that seems to be more his thing, anyway. Right? <laughs> I mean, that's part of the job. Everything is part of the job. You know, infrastructure, all that. But I wouldn't. I wouldn't get the same uh, um, sort of satisfaction out of being mayor if I didn't get to tackle that. So I put together a task force of uh, of business leaders and education leaders yep. who proposed that we use that one last eighth, one eighth of a cent that produces about $31 million a year, that we put that into high quality full day pre-K for our four year olds because the research is very compelling that if you have a dollar to spend in education, that dollar is best spent early on with young people before they ever get behind in the first place when their mind is developing and so forth. And we identified a gap of students who aren't getting that. Took that to the voters, the voters approved it 53.5%. Uh, 
And uh, it had support from the business community uh, and, and just folks across the city. Of course, anytime you want to raise taxes, that's controversial. It is. Uh, but I was very upfront with folks. I said, I am asking you for a tax increase. Yeah. You know, there's no way to sugarcoat Well, it. local control is also essentially a conservative idea. We hear a lot about that from Republicans in the legislature. Sure. We want less power at the state level. Let's give it to, to the communities. That, all of that helped. Right. Yeah, I think so these are four-year-olds who are going to benefit from this, and it's 22, what's the total it's, number of uh, kids? 22,400 four-year-olds over the next eight years. Over the next eight years will benefit from, from, the, from this increase. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Co Congressman, another area in which Texas has declined to play with the federal government has been on education. Remember a couple That's years right. ago, race, race to, to the, the top. top. Sure. Talk a little bit about the, now that you're in Washington, you're part of Congress, you understand the federal piece of this a little bit better. Talk about federal education policy as it does or doesn't relate to some of the issues that Mayor is uh, talking about. Sure. Well, of course, you know, President Obama, thankfully, has made pre-kindergarten education one of the centerpieces of his education policy for the, the remainder of his term. Right. Uh, and so that's great to see. And, you know, it's great to see that San Antonio was even ahead of that curve. Yeah. Uh, and so, but in terms of our, our Texas's place uh, in, as it relates to other states and in education, you know, I think Race to the Top, of course, was a program funded by the federal government, Department of Education, that was offering states significant money to essentially come up with best practices right. that would then be spread out because, you know, scaled essentially to other places. Right. There were two states, it was our Texas and I believe Alaska, that didn't participate. There were only two states out of the 50 that declined to participate. And in you had to top. compete for this money, basically, right? right? You had to compete, yeah. but, you know, uh, we essentially gave up a chance at significant amounts of money, probably, the estimates were about $800 million. Um, and so uh, it was, I think, a missed opportunity to set national standards with the other states, yep. uh, to really come on to some innovative ideas in education policy. Right. Uh, I think we could absolutely use them in Texas. Uh, we still have a challenge in terms of our dropout rates. I was vice chairman of the Higher Education Committee, uh, and so you know I got a firsthand look at the fact that we've got a lot of our colleges that still have higher dropout rates than our high schools, our community colleges, for example, and even right. some of our state universities. So there are a lot of challenges in Texas education, yeah. and there are a lot of things that we could be doing better, uh, and we're missing out on some of those things because right. we didn't participate. The objection, Congressman, though, to the race uh, to the top funding was similar to what we hurry here now on Medicaid. It's short-term money. It's not going to be there forever, and there are strings attached. Sure. Right? No, aren't, I, those, aren't the strings attached arguments, you know, don't you have some sympathy for that argument? I mean, there's strings attached in any relationship. You know, I have a girlfriend. There's strings attached to that. Right. You, know, I mean, uh, you, you have a husband or a wife. There's strings attached to that. But no ring attached yet. Yeah. No right. ring yeah. attached. I'm working. Yes, wave your I'm finger. No it. ring. He has no ring yet. That's right. You know? Yeah. There, there's, to some extent, there's strings attached when local governments get state money. Right. Uh, so, but that's become a formulaic yeah. response yeah. Uh, on, that the governors used to decline not only race to the top funds and, of course, the Medicaid funds, but also... Uh, unemployment insurance. We turned the state turned down five hundred Se session, session oh, two ago, yeah. Right, yeah. a few sessions ago, uh, right in the middle of the economic crisis, turned right. down five hundred and fifty million dollars in unemployment insurance. And again, strings attached was the was right the, the same mantra. Uh, yeah. And so, you know, I mean, it, it's just become, I think, a knee jerk reaction that's more rooted in the governor's politics than it is really in any kind of. Uh, sound fiscal or economic or social right. decision. Let's say, Mr. Mayor, let's stipulate that the governor is not alone in pushing back against the idea that the federal government should be doing our business for us. We have the most uh, uh, active lawsuits against the federal government of any state. That may not be a distinction people are necessarily proud of, but there it is. We have demonstrated on matters like immigration, environmental protection, uh, health care, that we're very quick to push back against the federal government. You're both native Texans. Isn't there a theory that if you come from Texas, you don't want other people messing in your stuff. Hasn't that been the state's history for so long? The governor and the other people, because there are many other people who see the, the world the way sure. the governor does, don't those people have a point historically that this is consistent with the Texas we've always known? Well, there's no question that Texas has always had this, this strong independent streak. I mean, we were our own nation at one time, right? May, maybe again, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hope not. Let's yeah. hope not. Um, however, what you see is the difference between... Um, governors in states uh, like Florida, now with Rick Scott, or Jan Brewer, 
who are saying, okay, well, let's, or, or Arkansas is another good example, who have a productive relationship with the federal government, constructive relationship with the yeah. federal government, versus uh, really political grandstanding on the part of Governor Perry. You think he's a grandstander? <laughs> sure. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I'm just going to let that sit there. <laughs> um, let, let me ask about immigration. You know, time's going to go by quickly. We're going to try to cover a lot of ground. Let me ask you about immigration. We live now in a state that will soon be Hispanic majority. Right now we're a minority. Majority percentage of Anglos is below 50% of the total population. In so many ways, Texas, and specifically San Antonio, is going to model for the rest of the country what the near future looks like. The opportunities and the challenges. Mm -hmm. A uh, lot of discussion now post-election about comprehensive immigration reform. There seems to be a group of bipartisan senators moving towards some solution, if not on path to citizenship, then on a guest worker program. The business community and labor have said to come together on this. Would you each talk, Mr. Mayor, first about where you think we will end up and where in a perfect world we should end up on this issue? Uh, well, I believe that there will be comprehensive immigration reform. This, this, of all of the issues out there, seems to be the one where the parties are getting closer and closer together. Right. And there's, there's daylight. It's not the usual back and forth and blame game and so forth. Um, I believe that we'll have something consistent with the framework that has been set out by that, that gang of eight, the bipartisan group, uh, probably a little bit more stringent. So there will be a pathway to citizenship. Yep. But... There are going to be some hoops, I would imagine, that folks have to jump through uh, that perhaps uh, the, the Democrats, especially the liberal Democrats, w won't be fond of, uh, that I wouldn't put in there necessarily if I were crafting the legislation myself. Uh, that's where I think the compromise is probably going to go. Yeah, yeah Congressman, you remember that when President Bush was in office, there was a move towards some moderate immigration reform that conservatives, folks to the right of President Bush, uh, uh, helped to derail. Right. Uh, what has changed from then to now that we're suddenly on the verge, on the lip of, of being able to agree on something? Uh, well, I mean, I think the November 6th election happened. You know? Is that what it was? Uh, uh, I think that, you know, what, what's been remarkable with the Republican Party post-election is that there at least seems to be a crew of folks who really are trying to move the party uh, in a more you know, more responsive direction. Are they doing it out of concern for the future of the country, or is it politics? Or is it both? Well, I mean, you know, I think that you want to believe that people do the right thing because they believe it's the right thing to do. Yeah. Uh, is that but, what's happening in this case? But I think that, you know, I think it's directly, it's, it's primarily political. Um, Had Governor Romney won the election, would we be having this conversation? That's a good question. Um, probably not. Probably not. Although uh, I, I can see a scenario where, where you would have, where it would have been a Nixon. Maybe on their scenario. terms. Yeah. I think instead yeah. of... You know, you, Julian answered the question about what would happen. I think that we will end up with an earned path to citizenship. I think if, President, if there were President Romney in office right now, you would still see the issue addressed, but you certainly wouldn't be talking about a path to yeah. citizenship. You, you would be a more conservative about, version yeah, of it. Yeah, you would have a, more, a, a guest worker program, maybe. Right. Yeah. Do you yeah. see in the Republican Party, whether it's uh, Senator Rubio, Senator Graham, Senator McCain, any of the people who've been participating in this conversation, do you see ideas that you guys can get behind in terms of where we're headed on this issue, Mayor? On immigration reform? Yeah. Well, sure. I'm, you know, I think what, what the Republican Party has pushed out has been the necessity to continue to enhance border security. And, and I agree with enhancing border security to the extent that means using technology, for instance. Yep. Um, and sometimes personnel where it makes sense. I and mean, we already doubled the number of border uh, patrol agents on the southwestern border since 2004, so there are more folks down there than ever. Of course, Senator Cornyn and Governor Perry, when, when asked about this issue, almost always say, first, the problem is the federal government has failed to secure our border. That's what has to happen before we do anything else on immigration. Yeah, I believe that's a red herring. Uh, you're never going to have zero people coming across any border. Right. I mean, you don't have zero pre people staying in prison. You know, you have jail breaks. So... Right. You're never going to get it down to absolute zero, right. right? But also, I think we've got to bear in mind that, that this president, more than any other president of the United States, has put dedicated more resources to the border uh, than ever in American history. Yeah. There are 652 miles of border barrier, essentially, including fencing right. along the border. And in fact, deportations are up in the Obama years over the Bush years significantly. Yeah, deportations right. are up and crossings are significantly down. down. Right. They're at a 40-year low. 
And part of that, I think it's a combination of things. Number one, you've got more border security. Uh, second, of course, the American economy has not been as strong as it's been in the past. L- less of an incentive to cross Right, the than say, that, let's say the, ni- the late 1990s. Right. Uh, but then the other thing is that you've got a Mexican economy that is absolutely booming right now. Uh, their GDP is off the charts. And right. so because of all of those factors and probably others, uh, you've just got less folks that are Maybe coming. they should be concerned about Texans crossing over into Mexico. Yeah. <laughs> well, then the number, the you net make migration... make sound attractive. Yeah. <laughs> the net migration number right now is zero, right. essentially. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so if this is the moment, for, because, because of where we are in terms of the crossings uh, and because of the politics, this is the moment that we should do comprehensive reform. So on this question of demographic change and the, the fact that we will be, whether it's five years, 10 years, 15 years, Hispanic majority state, you both grew up in what is now, and I suspect has been for some time, a Hispanic majority city. Sure. Tell, us what it, tell us what we have to look forward to in terms of opportunities and challenges when the state becomes Hispanic majority, when the population finally turns. What, you know, I've seen Steve Murdoch's numbers that in 2000, the five and under population in Texas was 44% Latino, 40% Anglo. By 2040, it's going to be 70% Latino, 17% Anglo, five and unders in Texas. Yeah. Population is changing fast. What do we have to look forward to? Uh, a replenishment of exactly what has made America great, you know, a community with uh, a, har- a great work ethic, a very patriotic, uh, you know, folks of faith, uh, I think what we have to look forward to is just an America that is positioned to excel in the 21st century the way that right. it excelled in the, in the 18th, 19th, and 20th century if we get the issue of, of uh, educational achievement right. right. Now that, right and now that is a, that's a big issue. Yeah, I mean, the right. Hispanic community right. is undereducated generally right. right now. And so if you don't do that, then it's gonna, it could be more of an albatross. Steve right. Murdoch talks about you know, different scenarios and that if things continued and we didn't improve educational achievement, that in 25 years we could actually have a higher percentage of Texans without a high school diploma than we have right now, right. Uh, which would be a step backward in a 21st century global economy that depends so much on brain power. Right. And but, that, has, that has been a- alarming because if you look at the goals that were set by Texas in 2001, the closing the gaps goals, yep. the only group of all the categories of folks where, where the t- state of Texas has not hit its target on college enrollment is with Hispanics. And that is your fastest growing group. Right. Uh, and so it's, it's something that we're going to have to solve uh, yeah. over the next, in the coming years. There are people who are concerned about higher ed, public ed, public health, infrastructure, the places growing the sure. fastest, the valley, El Paso, are places where we have historically invested the least in roads and bridges and sewers oh, and right. broadband. Well, and Evan, you've heard me talk about what my philosophy about an infrastructure of opportunity. Right. Uh, and essentially, you know, I believe that just as there's an infrastructure of streets and roads and highways that helps everybody get to where they want to go on the road, that in America, what has made us successful is that we have built up an infrastructure of opportunity that allows everybody to get to where they want to go in life. Yep. So great public schools and universities, a strong healthcare system, and an economy that's built around well-paying jobs. But there's a few pieces to that infrastructure of opportunity, and one of them is literally a physical piece. So, for example, in the Texas Valley, where you have a million and a half residents, mostly Hispanic, uh, not, until, uh, it, not until probably the late 1990s could you get a doctoral degree. Still down in that area, there are only about 20 doctoral programs. Yeah. Uh, in San Antonio, you couldn't get a doctoral degree until about 1988. Uh, and so, literally, there's still no medical school Anywhere although south of San Antonio. One is coming. It's coming online. Right. Uh, there's not a law school, although a lot of people don't want more lawyers. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, but and there, but the, there's a lack of professional schools. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say that, that it is great that the Valley is going to get a medical school, but I mean, what about a law school? What about engineering programs, yeah. accounting programs? Just a whole series of investments. You're going to have to backfill a lot of things made. that oh, are absolutely. there in the, in the, in the rest well, of the Well, And absolutely. also in a resource environment that is different from yesteryear. Indeed. In a resource environment where they're asking the community to put up a significant amount of the revenue if they want to get the medical school or the other right. program. That didn't used to be the case. Well, yeah. and, and the I've state always used thought, to write the check. That's right. Sure. And, and I've always thought that one of the things that hamstrings the valley, for example, because you don't have a concentration of wealth there the way you do in other places. Take Dallas, for example. Um, when North Texas, I believe it was North Texas, made a play for a law school, uh, and they were putting up a building that was worth, I'm, I'm going on memory now, but I think it was worth 
somewhere between 10 and 14 million dollars. But that was their buy-in, that was their investment, which yep. made sense. You don't have the same... H harder in the valley. Right. Yeah, it's harder to come by down much, there. Much harder. Sure. Um, let me toggle over to guns, if you don't mind, an issue that is sure. of interest in Texas and of interest nationally. Uh, Congressman, the president said in his State of the Union, because of Tucson, because of Aurora, Colorado, because of you know, Newtown, Connecticut, uh, we're going to talk about an assault weapons ban, we're going to talk about a ban on high-capacity magazines, we're going to talk about um, uh, universal background checks. Let's have an up-or-down vote. Doesn't look like Maybe on universal on background, background checks, there may be an up or down vote. Doesn't even look like there's going to be an up or down vote on the assault weapons ban or the high capacity magazine ban. What's, what's going on on this issue at the national level? Well, um, you know, if you ask me where I think it's going to end up, I think we're going to end up with some kind of bill doing universal background checks. Yeah. And we should because 90% of Americans are already there and agree with that. Well, in fact, the public, by a majority of, of, uh, in each of those issues, the public is for a ban on assault right. weapons, ban on high-capacity magazines, and overwhelmingly on the, on the no, universal No, and magazine. you're right. Uh, and, and quite frankly, it looks like, at least within the U.S. Senate, because I think folks widely acknowledge that if something's going to pass, it's going to start in the Senate first yep. because of the politics, because yep. uh, you have a Democratic majority there. Uh, in the Senate, uh, the momentum has waned, uh, in terms of doing limitations on high-capacity magazines and on an assault weapons ban. Le yeah, Leader Reid seems not inclined to even put it before the full Senate. Uh, no, that's right. He said that he thought it couldn't get 40 votes, and uh, so, you know, uh, it wasn't going to be part of the Why is the Democratic strategy not to put that to a full vote and let people be publicly, on the record, voting against? You know, honestly, Evan, on that one, I think that, uh, I think we should take a vote on it. There were things that I served in the legislature for 10 years, and there were times when, you know, and it's, it's a very freewheeling process in the Texas legislature. You can add amendments to just about anything. Yep. Uh, there were times we had amendments and people said, well, yeah, don't put that up because we really don't want to take a vote on that. Right. You know? But there are certain issues where the country needs to know where people stand. Right. And they deserve to know where people you stand. You don't want to take a vote, don't run for office. Yeah, sure. Isn't that right? Sure. Um, sure. sure. Mr. Um, Mr. Mayor, I mentioned to you before we came up here that I had the opportunity to interview Kasim Reed, your colleague, Mayor of sure, Atlanta, sharp guy, Georgia. Yeah. Great guy, interesting guy. And I asked him about why he supports the assault weapons ban and the high-capacity magazine ban. He said, I'm worried about my police force in the city of Atlanta encountering these guys with these weapons of war. I want to protect my police when they walk into a situation. I want to be sure that they're not going to be jumped by people who have weapons they don't have any business having. He made it about law enforcement. What, sure. when, when you make the argument for these things, what is, the, what is your reference point? Uh, well, as a mayor, it certainly is that. And, yeah. and police chiefs across the country have, have been supportive of, of gun control measures. So it's that, but it's also, you know, I just take a look physically at the situations that, that you encounter. And I think the problem with the allowing, for instance, some of these high-capacity magazines is the element of surprise. I mean, let's go back to the, the Tucson shooting uh, of Representative Giffords. How many people is somebody going to be able to take out, basically, before someone can, even if they have a gun, can do something about it? Um, to me, that's the question, is that you're never going to be able to prevent right. somebody from getting, getting off at least a shot. Um, you're always, that person's always going to have the element of surprise with them. Then the question is, how quickly can they actually injure how many people before somebody can do something, even accepting the argument that, they, that the other side makes about this theoretical good guy who's there, ready, willing, and able to effectively take out that person. Yep. And, uh, and I think that, that these guns and these magazines that, that together allow for somebody to get off a certain number of shots like that in that, in that context is not good public policy. You're both Texans. What do you have against the Second Amendment? <laughs> Nothing. In fact, I'll give you a concrete example from my end. Um, you know, about a month and a half ago, I got an email that the subject matter line was, I'll kill you. And then the person described how he was going to kill me and my, and my wife and my child. You know, I mean, that was the email. Uh, and, you know, that evening, uh, there was a police officer outside of our house. The first thing I wanted to do was have a gun in case that person actually did come into my house. And I wouldn't begrudge people. I don't begrudge folks for having for owning their guns. And in certain situations, yeah, yeah, you know. I mean, I completely understand that. 
But uh, however, there are other situations um, and, and, and in which I do think that reasonable restrictions should be put in place. Yeah. Uh, not that you take away everybody's guns or don't allow them to have them, but but I do think that there are reasonable restrictions that can be put in place. Well, Congressman, think, you, you understand when oh. Texans say it's part of our culture, we have this right, sure. we don't want the government to infringe upon our second oh, amendment. Oh, sure. Rights. You know, and, and you know, we did an interview some time back, and I told a story about about being on the road to Marfa um, in 2000, I think it was 2010, I took my mom for her birthday to the Marfa Film Festival that year, and we drove from San Antonio, and it's about a six-hour drive. And, uh, you know, it was nearing sunset, and I, off in the distance, I saw this house all by itself, uh, almost like a farmhouse. And I thought, you know, if you live in that house and you don't own a gun, you've got to be crazy. Um, because if something happens or people break in or... Yeah. or the, you're going to have to defend you're by, yourself. You're by yourself. You're right. by yourself. The police right. aren't going to get there anytime right. soon. Right. So for a lot of different reasons like that, because our right. state has such a rural history and because we have such a sporting history, uh, it's natural that that's very deep into the culture. But there are also urban scenarios. And, you know, and so these, these changes can be made in a way that respects the Second Amendment. Um, you know, I support concealed carry. I voted for the Castle Doctrine in the legislature. Uh, and so it's not like I've got a grudge against the Second Amendment. Right. Uh, I respect the Second Amendment, but also realize that there need to be reasonable restrictions on, on the kind of weapon and how much ammunition you can fire out. And, you know, can a, can a politician seconds. in Texas succeed running statewide being for restrictions on guns? Who can knows? Can you support, <laughs> well, we may test that. We'll talk about that shortly. Uh, could you, could you go out to the, pop, to the full population of the state, to voters all, all across the state, not just in liberal enclaves, but across the entire state, and say, I support background checks, I support assault weapons bans, I support a ban on high-capacity magazines, vote for me? Can you do that in this Texas today? In the Texas of today, I don't know. It's a good question. Um, to the extent that people vote on one issue, no. To the extent that people vote on a series of issues, uh, then maybe so. You might be able to... Yeah, as long as, as long, I think as long as you don't open your speeches with that, I think you're... <laughs> yeah. Th th that's been tried in the past yeah. and hasn't gone so well. That's I would right. also say that, yeah. that, that when people oppose you on an issue, unless they're absolutely fanatical, and people are fanatical on yeah. different issues, including this one, if you're upfront with them, you're honest with them about what your position is and why, and you don't try to hide that from them, you explain it to them, uh, then if folks believe that they can trust you in terms of that you're, you have a reasonable thought process yep. and that you're not going to lie to them, then most folks can disagree with you on some issues and still support you. Um, I recognize there are some folks that if you're not with them on one issue, hundred percent, right? Yeah, well, yeah, right. And, and also, yeah. And I think if they understand that you respect what they believe, also, yeah. Yeah. and you can see why they believe what they believe, right? Um, but ultimately, I think, Evan, I think you just have to stand up for what you believe, yeah. and whatever happens, happens. That's it. Yeah. Uh, let's, let's spend some time. We're going to go to questions in a bit, but we have some more time, and I want to use the time we have now to talk about the Democratic Party in Texas yeah. and the two of you, uh, your thoughts about the party and your thoughts about where you may find yourselves in a, in a couple of years. I, I asked you backstage, how old were you when the last Democrat was elected <laughs> statewide in Texas? <laughs> and you said? Well, in 94, I was... Uh, I was 20 years old. You were both 20 years old the last time yeah. a Democrat was elected statewide mm -hmm. yeah. in Texas. What happened to your party? You are both proud Democrats. You don't shy from that. The mayoralty is nonpartisan in San Antonio, mm -hmm. but nobody mistakes you for a Republican mayor. You've made clear where your sympathies are. Congressman, you're a proud Democrat. We're here right. and now are in Congress. What happened to your party in your lifetime? That And the legislature, Democrats, are nearly an endangered species. You could argue Democrats are the third party in a two-party state right now. <laughs> What, what happened, Congressman? What happened uh, to the Democratic Party? Well, I mean, if you look at generally what happened with the South, you know, it slowly went from, you know, of course, when, when President Johnson was in office and even through the 70s and the 80s and even into the 90s, it went from, um, from Democratic control to Republican control. Uh, and, you know, in some ways, uh, it, it has been, and I saw this, and I'm quoting somebody, and so I want to give somebody else credit. Um, Oh, I think it was Paul Steckler. I read an article about him, and he made the point that it really was more of a partisan change and less an ideological change in that the state was always fairly conservative. 
Uh, and so you had more of a change of parties rather than So people who call themselves yeah. D's, call themselves R's, but fundamentally what they believe wasn't all right. that different. Yeah, I think right. Ann Richards said that at one point. I may be wrong, but I yeah. think that uh, I've seen it attributed to Ann Richards that the conservative was always there. It was did, did, so, so you don't think you all lost an argument? There was no argument that took place about what the priorities of the state should be or how to address the problems of the state. And once upon a time, Democrats had the answers. They won the argument. But at a certain point, everything changed, and Republicans won the argument. You don't think that's the issue? No, I think that's some of it. I, I do believe that, that um, in, in the late 70s, and particularly after the election of Reagan, that, that there's generally been a posture in Texas and a lot of America of that government is somehow bad, that it's wasteful, that when people think about government, they think of an oppressive hand and they think of waste. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I mean, and that generally we've gone in that direction. So philosophically, the Republicans who have been in power for these years have believed in smaller government, less of that hand or that right. boot heel yeah. on your neck, right? Yeah. We want to get government out of people's lives. That's why it should be so worrisome that, that the numbers, the percentages that this younger generation is voting for Democrats in, uh, that, that should send a strong message because those folks weren't around for the Great Society. <laughs> Yeah. You know, they weren't around for Ronald Reagan. They're making decisions independent yeah. of any historical... Right. They, you can right. learn, they can learn the lessons of the past yeah. and ensure that, that, that they make public policy even better than prior generations, but they don't have to assume that just because you do something like Medicaid yeah. or, or uh, you know, invest in education, that that's going to be wasted. Right. That's not uh, somehow bad. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Co Congressman, how do you persuade people to come back to the Democratic Party? If people went from being these to ours... And it wasn't as much an argument that they lost, really, as it was just, well, we were always conservative, and that's the fashion right now. How do you get them back? And did the Democratic Party do anything wrong in the last 20 years to lose those people? Well, I guess a few things on that. First, I think the, the state Republican leadership, including the senators, are helping our cause a lot uh, <laughs> by what they're doing. You think they're helping to push the pendulum back? Oh, sure. Yeah. Sure. And, and, and I think the reason you see that is because they've gotten very spoiled uh, we are now the state that has gone the longest of any state in the nation without electing a Democrat statewide. It's been since 1994, um, which is remarkable when you think of some of the very conservative places in this country. Yeah. Uh, but when you see, uh, you know, for example, Senator Ted Cruz and the positions that he's taken, uh, at, you know, in a press conference yesterday, the one that they did, uh, I heard him say that that. In, many, in some instances, people with no health care no healthcare insurance at all are better treated than people with Medicaid. Uh, how does that make sense? You know? uh, but, but very kind of extremist rhetoric and positions like that uh, that are really helping. Or, or voting against the Violence Against Women right, Act. Right, or voting against the Violence Against Women Act. Right. Voting against a multiple sclerosis resolution on the Senate floor. Because you don't like the way something yeah, now, is worded. I mean, now, this is the stuff that they can get away with right now because all they got to do is play to their primary base. That is what's changing right, right now. Right, but what you're describing, Mayor, Congressman, are things that the Republicans are doing that would cause people to come back to the party. But affirmatively, what should the Democrats have done? What should the Democrats be doing? Should you all just basically wait everything oh. out? No, 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 not at all. I mean, I think what you see are efforts like Battleground Texas that's just starting to take off yeah. uh, in terms of engaging folks that have historically not participated. We also have one of the worst in the bottom three in terms of voter participation rates in the nation. Right. Uh, a few years ago, I think we were dead last, or 49th. Right. Uh, and so part of it is also getting folks to participate who have not participated in the past. Yeah. Uh, and I really do believe that if we had more voter participation, that this state would already be a purple state, if not a blue state. Uh, Mayor, you know, the, what's often said is that if Latinos would turn out to vote as a percentage of the eligible population in numbers equivalent to where the Anglo population turns out, in fact, to the congressman's point, th these elections might be more competitive. So why haven't Latinos turned out, and what do the Democrats have to do to get Latinos to turn out in greater numbers? Uh, well, uh, I mean, to begin with, all of Texas turnout is lower than almost every other state. But yes, the Latino community turns out at an even lower rate. So why haven't they turned out? Uh, I think a lot of that has to do with their income status. They're generally yeah. lower income. They're younger. Younger. Um, you know, as a profile, generally less educated. Yeah. Uh, so those things certainly play into it. Uh, what does the Democratic Party have to do, or what do, what do folks have to do to get them out? It's a combination of things. What Battleground Texas is doing, applying 
the new model of voter out, outreach, the new technologies to right. get people out there. Some of the same data mining operations that yeah. helped the Obama campaign right. in the last cycle. And, and that bore fruit right. in Florida, in Ohio, in Colorado, in, in uh, Virginia, in North Carolina. Yeah. There's a lot of low-hanging fruit, by the way. Um, and then also you need great candidates. You need people that can excite that community. Right. I, I have said before that if, if Henry Cisneros had run for governor in 1990, uh, that that would have been the first time that a mainstream, mainline, very popular Hispanic had run for governor, that would have changed the dynamic of Texas politics. You, would, you wouldn't be essentially starting from zero now. You'd be really moving, you'd be in the 20th or 25th year of, of this comfort level with people electing. Sure, sure. I mean, it's not the right. same, but yeah. when he ran uh, right. in 1981 for mayor of San Antonio, the Hispanic participation more than doubled that Right, year, just by virtue of his candidacy. Yeah. So on the subject yeah. of candidates, Ahem. <laughs> Are you going to run for governor in 2018? 2018? 2018. 2018. I was I very know. deliberate in the year that I chose. <laughs> You've already declined to run in 2014. You're running for mayor again in 2013. You have two more terms as mayor, prospectively, should you win this time and the next time. You'd be term limited out. In May of 2017, I would observe an interesting moment to launch a gubernatorial race <laughs> for 2018. <laughs> Yeah. So, are, are you going to run? I'll get to you in a second. Just don't, don't worry. <laughs> Thank you. Are, are you going to run for governor in 2018? I have no idea. I mean, that's my honest answer. I right. have no idea. Uh, you, know, you know, the I'm, headline will be Castro declines to say he won't run for governor. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's an accurate headline. I mean, I've told folks in San Antonio. Yeah. Uh, very uh, frankly, that that if I do a great job as mayor of San Antonio, that I'm going to look around after my ten years over and see what the landscape is in 2017 going into 2018. Yeah. So it's possible that I, I would run, or I may not. It just depends on how things are going. But you are considering it. Yeah, yeah, I'll consider that. After I'm done as mayor, I'll consider that and, and anything else that's out there. Congressman, will you run against Ted Cruz for the <laughs> Senate in 2018? <laughs> Yeah, that's right. Yeah, somebody. Uh, um, no, I mean I'm. Fo I, I just got to Congress. Wait, did uh, you say? Did you say no? As in no, you're not going to do it, or no, you wish I hadn't asked you this yeah. question. <laughs> no, I mean, first of all, I don't know what I'll be doing in six years, but you know, I'm focused right now on serving San Antonio. I just got there. This is my third month. Uh, you know, but I will say, Evan, that that I'm very disappointed with how Ted not only has conducted himself, because that's style, but with the substance of his votes in the Senate. Um, I really do think that he could be a leader on so many issues, including the immigration issue, and has refused to do that. Uh, and we've run into each other a few times, and I want to say that he's always been nice to me. Yep. He's never been rude, never been discourteous. Um, and you know, and we do, you know, we've intended to sit down and talk. Right. Um, you know, and I'm not saying anything that I wouldn't tell him, and I sure he disagrees with me. Right. Um, but you know, over the next six years, I think that whoever runs against him, I think that the Democrats will put up a strong candidate, mostly based on the substance, because those positions that he's taking are badly out of step with not only where Texas is now, yeah. but certainly where it will be in 2018. Let me take your humility and your coyness and all that sincerely. And then let me end this portion of the program by asking you each to take yourselves out of the conversation about the time when Democrats come back into power. Each of you tell me one Democrat in Texas, not the other, right? Yeah. Each of you <laughs> yeah. tell me one Democrat in Texas you would be paying attention to were you us in terms of when should the party come back it will be in part on the backs of this person. Each of you tell me one Democrat. Uh, yeah, I, there are several people. Give me one. Just give me one. Or I, you can give me multiple if I you mean, want. I mean, Anchia and Davis. You're talking about Rafael Anchia, state representative from Dallas, Wendy Davis, state senator sure. from Fort Worth. You like those two? Yeah. Congressman. Yeah, well, he, he was supposed to give you one. I was, was. going to take the other one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I mean... Yes, look. I'm sure this is the first time yeah. he's messed with you. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. I hope that Wendy runs. Uh, I hope that Rafael runs. At this point, I think, like most folks, I just want a Democrat to win statewide. Now, I really don't care who it is. Right. You know, I, we just need to break through this, this you know, Republican dominance that has taken the state so far to the right. But there are a lot of talented folks. I mean, I think Trey Martinez-Fisher uh, in the legislature 
I mean, he gives them hell. And you need somebody like that, uh, especially because these guys have gotten so far out there. Uh, and Mike Villarreal has a lot of potential in the future. Um, so there, there's, a, there's a good bench of Democrats who are ready to run for office. Yep. I think the task for all of us, not only the elected officials, but everybody, is to, to lay the infrastructure to make winning possible. Okay. We're going to stop our portion of this here. Let's please give the mayor and the congressman a big hand. Thank and you. Thank you for their time. Thank Thank you. You. Thank you. We, um, we'll bring the lights up. We have microphones on either aisle. I'd ask you to line up respectfully of one another behind the microphones. Ask questions. Don't make speeches. I will bust you if you make a speech, please. <laughs> Uh, I suspect we'll have enough questions to go about the 15 minutes we have remaining, and we appreciate your participation. A lot of stuff we didn't cover. Let me ask before you do that, you told me that your dad's here. That's right. Could our dad you please is here. ask him to stand up? Where is he? There's our dad. There he is. Here's our dad. So our, uh, our dad graduated uh, from UT. He is I an alumnus of this university. Yeah. Right. 1963, right? UT, welcome, well, welcome back. <laughs> Good to have you back. We'll start over here. Yes. Uh, well, uh, I'm Mike Leborkin, and my, my question is, I'm very concerned about the future of democracy in our country because of the problem with gerrymandering okay. and the problem of, well, the Electoral College. Okay. Uh, how would you address that? Yeah, on the redistricting question, first, we had maybe more, Ross, more than 200 elections on the ballot in November. There weren't but 10 that were competitive. We've stopped having competitive elections. Many people blame mayor redistricting. Is that right? No, I agree with that, and uh, you know, it'll be interesting as analyses come forward of the California model now, a commission yep. model, and perhaps other states go to that. There needs to be a better way that we can get to a system where these districts are no, not so polarized either way, because the the end result of that is in Congress, then you know you have the Republicans just voting extreme to the right, and Democrats, although they haven't, I think they haven't been as far to the left as they used to be, still. If they have a very safe seat, they can safely just no, be on no the motivation left. to move. Yeah, to the they middle don't have the motivation to, to move to the middle. You so. remember, Congressman, when you were in the legislature, Democrats, when they were in power, used to draw the maps in their favor. Republicans draw the maps in their favor. Now it's been ever thus, right? Yeah. Although Republicans did it twice in a decade when I was there, and two, well, I got there in 2003, and my first session, I went to Oklahoma to try to stop Tom Delay on that yeah. re redistricting. Right. Uh, um, but I do, I agree, if the commission model works, some kind of bipartisan group, right. I think that we should do it that way, and I, I would certainly support that. Uh, and to give you an example of the effect of redistricting, right now in the Congress, Republicans hold about, I think about 234, 235 seats to Democrats 200, 201. Democrats won in 2012 a million more votes in House of Representative races across the country in and total, still, right, yeah. in total, and are still behind by all those number of seats. Because the votes were not distributed sure. in ways where they could pick because up. Because the districts are drawn in such a what way. What about the Electoral College question? You know, it used to be that this was no disrespect to the questioner. It used to be this was the kind of question you kind of roll your eyes and go, oh, well, that'll never actually be. But, you know, lately, there's really a discussion about whether the Electoral College is working. And there are a lot of people. Rick Hertzberg at The New Yorker is among those you know, kind of regular guy, good guy, thinks, no, we ought to get rid of this, knows a lot, we ought to get rid of the Electoral College. What about that? Uh, you know, I think the discussion is definitely worth having. At this point, I would say we should keep it the way it is. What would be the argument against it? I mean, a, a questioner didn't get a chance to explain, but what would be the argument, you think, for looking at it again? Well, I mean, I think the argument is a popular vote argument. Yeah. That, uh, you know, Gore and a couple of other folks would have been president if you went by the popular vote. Yeah. Um, maybe then the smaller state shouldn't have the same power as the largest. I guess maybe if I started to unravel it, it would be that you already have the mechanisms of representative democracy uh, embedded in the Senate because each state has two senators and right. in other ways yeah. that here you would have one moment for the highest office in the land where it would be, it would be direct right. democracy. Straight up or down. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Hi, Mayor Castro. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk briefly about what you've done to build community colleges, especially some of the green energy programs, and how you did it and what motivated you. Yeah, thank you very much for the question. Uh, what we've done is that we've actually embraced an entrepreneurial model of economic development through our local utility. San Antonio owns 
uh, CPS Energy. So CPS has partnered up with the Alamo Colleges and they do training for, uh, for companies that, San, that, that CPS has contracted with to provide solar power. Um, for example, we signed a deal with OCI Solar. They're going to provide us up to 400 megawatts of solar power on a power purchase agreement, but they've also agreed to invest uh, in a manufacturing facility in San Antonio, uh, and all told, uh, OCI Solar and their suppliers are going to provide 805 jobs mm -hmm. for San Antonians. That's going to be run. A lot of the training uh, will happen in the Alamo Colleges. We also have the Alamo Academies, which high schools work with the Alamo Colleges to craft uh, these, this apprenticeship model so students can both finish high school, get college credit, and have employable skills. They can go and work at places like Boeing uh, or uh, Lockheed Martin, and also, if they want, continue their education at one of our Alamo colleges. Good. Thank yes. Uh, thank you guys for coming out tonight. Um, I'm a student here at the LBJ School of Public Affairs, and first off, I want to ask you, either one of you, are you guys hiring for the summer? Are they hiring? Are they hiring? Hiring, yeah. yeah. Sorry, that was just a little joke. I, I, actually thought, I thought he asked you if either of you was high. I know. Hiring, hiring, sorry. Uh, yeah, I don't even drink. <laughs> or smoke. I thought maybe there were some Ron Paul supporters in there. <laughs> no, my question is for the congressman. Um, what was the biggest challenge for you um, transitioning uh, from a state representative to being a U.S. representative? Oh, right. that's, a, that's a great question. Um, it really has been a whirlwind these last three months. Uh, the pace... Is so very is very quick. Um, it feels to me each week feels to me up there like the last few weeks of the Texas legislative session, which you know are very frenzied. Right. Uh, so the pace is has been you know I've been fine, but it, it takes a lot of dedication each week to keep up with it. Some of that is how much you put on your own schedule, uh, because yep. you know the the floor time that we spend on the on the floor of the house there is a lot less than it is here. Um, but certainly the pace. Uh, and then it is more partisan up there. Right. I, I got there for orientation. There's a table for Democrats and a table for Republicans. You do separate workshops and all that stuff. So it, it, right away, it feels different. And you are president of the freshman class. I'm one correct? of them, yeah. One, how, many, how many are there? We have four. So what does that mean? What, what special powers do you have to bestow on people as president? <laughs> Probably just the title. Though. That's it? <laughs> no, uh, yeah. it's, it's, you know, we put together events. Um, we did our first one, a bipartisan one, with the Republican freshman, and we invited Bill Gates, and so Bill Gates came and spoke. Talked to everybody. Uh, and we've got a second one coming up um, very soon. Okay. So. Joe Strauss or John Boehner? Oh, Joe, yeah. I'd prefer <laughs> Joe over John Boehner. Yeah. That's easy. Yeah. Yeah. The leadership yeah. style of the Texas speaker is preferable to you to the Absolutely. leadership style. Absolutely. In terms of yeah. institutionally, which one is preferable? I think it's a mixed bag. Yeah. The reason is... You know, the good thing about Washington is that your own party leaders determine your committee assignments. Yeah. In Austin, the speaker, who of course is Republican, gives everybody their committee assignments. Yeah. Uh, and so what happens is there's a reluctance sometimes to speak out when you disagree with something. Because yeah. you, you don't want your bill to fail. You don't want your <coughs> a bad assignment, et cetera. Yeah, in the last session you served in, uh, at, at the Capitol here in Austin, it was 101-49, Republicans to Democrats. The Democrats are much closer to parity with the Republicans. Does it feel that way as a Democrat in Washington, in Congress, that you have more of a place at the table or more of a way to affect the outcome of these votes? It does. It does. Okay. Drink more water if you need to. That's okay. <laughs> Ask him something. Okay, very good. <laughs> We both get allergies. He has them worse than I do. Today, Does he? So. The whole twin thing. It's, uh, it's, yeah. I, I have no doubt. We haven't talked about that. Sir. Um, I'm Hispanic. Uh, my mother's from San Antonio. My father's from Mexico. Mm -hmm. They couldn't wait to get out of their little towns, and they went to San Francisco, <laughs> okay. where they were very progressive, and they were both very involved with the Chicano movement of the 70s. My father was a uh, Comptroller at MALDEF, uh, the Mexican American Legal Defense and Education Fund, which I believe still has an office on the Riverwalk. And they always kind of beat it into me stay away from these kind of organizations because they're very conservative, that Hispanics are actually very conservative. And I wonder about that still. Are Hispanics conservative? If, you know, the state will one day be <clears throat> majority Hispanics and they actually vote. Will this just be a Republican state again? Um, could you speak to yeah. what your experiences were and 
could the Castro brothers just as easily be Republican? It's, 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 it's an interesting question. You know, Governor Bush used to get routinely 40, 44 percent of the vote running in Texas, yeah. right? And there's some assumption that if the Democrats simply wait for Hispanics to be in the majority, all will be well. But of course, there's no guarantee that Hispanics will monolithically vote Democratic any more than any other group will vote. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say that a couple of things are true. First, it's, it's accurate to say that, that probably Hispanics in Texas are a little bit more conservative than Hispanics in other places in the nation, certainly than California, um, but not by much. I mean, I would say probably the middle to low single digits. I don't think it's a double-digit difference. Sometimes you get a spike, but generally it's not that far off. Uh, to answer your question, I don't fundamentally believe, and I don't think the numbers bear out, that Hispanics are conservative, um, certainly not Republican, um, because generally over 60% of Hispanics vote Democratic. To the question of can there ever, can, could there be a Republican majority and, and a Hispanic majority, it, that's possible, but only if the Republicans get an extreme makeover in terms of their policies. Yeah. So if they change their policies, then, then I think that that would be I possible. Think, I, I think th it could happen, but if it happened, it would be a very different Republican Party than what you have now. Yeah, right. So can the Republican Party, of, or let's say it, right now, yeah. you know, capture a majority of Hispanics? No. Simply running a Republican-Hispanic candidate statewide, Ted Cruz no. only got 35% right. of the sure. Hispanic vote. Because it's not about, for the Senate, fundamentally, right? it's not about the personalities, it's about the policies. Right. Now here you had a Maldef baby, you all are Raza Unida babies, right? Was, was your mother not involved with Raza Unida party? She was, yeah. yeah. The year that we were born, she was the, uh, the Bear County chair of the party. Right. Uh, she and our father had been involved in the Chicano movement in the late 60s and uh, in early 70s. Uh, and, of course, the politics are very different today from what they were, but they're different, in, I think, in part because of the activism of that time. Yep. And because just Americans, you know, America has been America. It's gotten better and better and, and afforded this these new generations more opportunity right. to live out the American dream. And, and so we're, we've been blessed by that opportunity. Right. And we, we uh, have the chance to, to govern for everyone right. and not have to be concerned about only pitching for you know, one ethnic group and so right. forth. Right, got it. Yeah. Okay. We seem not to have a questioner over there, so we'll stay over here, please. Hi, this is on the subject of the uh, Latino vote. You mentioned some of the barriers that Latinos in Texas have to coming out and voting. Do you believe that it's more crucial for politicians to engage the Latino community by removing these barriers and working to remove them? Or do you think it's more important for the Latino community to engage in politics to kind of get some of issues affecting our community on the table in politics? Well, I mean, I think certainly the community shouldn't wait to be asked. Um, I think the community needs to engage. Uh, at the same time, you know, I do find disturbing uh, things like voter ID uh, so I think it's a combination of those two. <laughs> yeah, I would say that, uh, that it has to be both of those things. The community itself, there's nothing more powerful than when folks themselves are motivated enough to participate in the democratic process. Yeah. Um, that's, that's the most important thing. But it also takes both of the political parties and institutionally um, <coughs> the government reaching out to folks who haven't been participating, making it easier for them to vote, yep. uh, making it more convenient, and so forth. Are you yeah. susceptible, either of you, to the argument that some have made that the <laughs> voter ID legislation that passed, still in limbo legally in Texas, was a deliberate attempt on the part of Republicans <coughs> to diminish the turnout among Hispanics by creating barriers to participation? Well, I don't know if it was only, I don't think that it was necessarily only targeted at Hispanics. Uh, I believe that it was targeted at groups that, that are more likely to vote Democratic. So, uh, you know, whether that's young people, Hispanics, African Americans. So you think there groups. was some funny business going on here? Oh, in terms sure. Of yeah, I don't think that you see a wave all of a sudden, you know, before the presidential election, you see a wave of these laws coming forward in Republican dominated state legislators, legislatures for no reason. I Not mean, a there's a reason to that. Yeah. yeah. Now, I will say that whatever happens with that voter ID, what the Democrats in the legislature should be doing is going on the offense. In other words, empowering, for instance, principals in high schools to create voter vaults so that every senior who turns 18 during that school year, they would automatically be registered to vote and not yeah. wait for them to go and get registered to vote um, if they didn't do so when they got their driver's license. Uh, you know, uh, election day registration, 
is another example. Right. You know, these guys sometimes, you know, men and women in the legislature, sometimes I feel like they, that they and I used to tell him all the time when he mm. was in the state, you know, don't be so passive. I mean, you can do it in a, in a constructive way, right. but you have, to, you have to go after putting the right. infrastructure in Of course, place. as and you I'm, well know, Congressman, there are 55 Democrats in the House. The Democrats themselves cannot do anything and cannot prevent anything. In order for them to pass the kind of legislation that the mayor's sure. talking about, they'd have to find Republicans who joined them in this effort. Yeah, certainly. No, and there's actually, there's a law in the book that, books that allows schools to essentially do that, to yeah. offer these voter registration cards uh, to high school seniors. But no, you're right. Um, you know, Democrats are still in a tough position. Uh, in 2010, the 2010 election, you recall, we had worked our way back up to 74 Democrats in right. the House of Representatives, 76 Republicans. That was supposed to be our year to take back the House. And then the tsunami then, hit. Right, we got hit by that big wave. Yeah. Um, but we'll, we'll make our way back. We'll get back. Sir. Why does it seem so difficult to hold a lot of elected officials responsible for how they're stalling Obama's uh, health care plan, uh, jobs for returning soldiers, or even some of the things uh, such as what happened yesterday with Rick Perry, Ted Cruz, and John Cornyn? But not only that, but also with the tactics that uh, I forgot the representative's name from Tennessee, uh, uh, Ron Paul's son. Or even Senator Paul from Kentucky, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Rand Paul. Or Rand Paul. even the governor from Arizona. Why is it so difficult for even those who vote Republicans to see that these guys are not looking out for everybody's rights and freedoms and uh, well-being? Well, I believe that, that that the American public, the American voting public, does get a general impression of parties. They do believe that Democrats stand for certain things and Republicans stand for certain things. But when you start to, to get down to individual uh, votes or, or legislation Policy or maneuvers, issues. you know, one of, the, one of the most damaging things in politics and for our democracy right now is that people's attention span, I think, is shorter than it ever has been, their public attention span. Just think about something that was hot in the news, you know, a month ago, or six months ago. I mean, it just comes and goes like that now. That is probably not good. That's good for the politician that gets in trouble and wants to climb back. And then something I mean, look, we have Mark Sanford, right, running. Well, if, if that guy wins, well, that we'll, will be the ultimate. We'll, you know? we'll, we'll know in a few hours, and I'd probably venture I mean, a guess that he will win. Yeah, right? yeah, I mean, that's a perfect example. Yeah. You know, so, but, it, so that lack of attention span, that's, that's one of the right. reasons. The other one is things are so cacophonous today. Yeah. You have all of the media, mar the, the <coughs> media options. Well, they're so divided between yeah, I mean, ideology. It's not Walter Cronkite saying, and that's the way it is on whatever, whatever day. You know? yeah. People, people are, are watching whatever they're watching. And so their attention is divided, uh, and, and, and the attention span is so much shorter. All of that adds up <coughs> on both sides of the aisle for whatever they do, not just the Republicans, for the Democrats, too. You know, people just forget. <coughs> yeah. yeah. Let me ask, the, oh, we, do we have a question? Oh, good. We got somebody uh, pop Yeah, I just have one question about yeah. whether there are things as cities at San Antonio and Austin we can do to better leverage the collective strength of Texas. I've had the pleasure of working with Mike Burke and CPS Energy on your new energy economy thing. Yeah. But often as a district, we, it says we compete like five Rhode Islands and not one Texas. Um, you know, it's a lot easier if your 31 colleagues in Congress or able to go and ask for a federal research center on solar so we could get not just the jobs in San Antonio but more jobs in Austin right. and work together. What can we do to build the corridors and build those relationships? Well, I think that it starts with, you know, as, as the mayor, I'll say that it starts with reaching out. And so Mayor Leffingwell, for instance, you know, he and I have gotten together on several occasions, particularly <clears throat> about energy and about transportation and about the future of the Lone Star Rail Corridor, for instance. And so it starts with creating relationships um, among those elected officials, identifying movable initiatives that, that have some chance of actually coming to fruition. And I believe that on energy and, and on transportation, at least in the corridor between San Antonio and Austin, that there's real opportunity to work together. And we're, we're going to do that. Mark, am I okay to take these last two? Okay. Ma'am, and then I'll come over here. Yes. Oh, as a parent, I am very uh, interested in how your parents were able to raise two extremely successful Hispanic men um, to be as well educated and well spoken as you are. No, well, thank you. Would you like to brag on yourselves? Yeah. <laughs> Perhaps that's a 
I'll let Joaquin Should've go for first. For the father. <laughs> yeah, what, yeah do the what, what, so what was the secret sauce? Well, no, I mean, I think that, you know, one of the things about our, our parents um, was that both of them were fairly uh, lenient. Um, you know, you might think, you always hear about parents, and obviously many of y'all are parents in this room and grandparents. I'm a parent myself. Uh, that, that you have to be on them and you know, make sure that they're, that they're always doing what you want them to do. I mean, we kind of regulated ourselves after a while. I mean, well, we but, were given a good foundation, and then we sort of, they didn't have to get after us, get on us about things. After well, and I think the competition between the two of us really drove us to. Is that right? Yeah, that's true. That's true. The cliche, the, the cliche is that, but I suppose like all cliches, there's a germ of truth in it, right? That's oh, it. yeah. Well, we shared, a group, I mean, we shared a room growing up for 17 years. You know? Right. Um, and, and then we went were, to Stanford together, and went then went Stanford. to Harvard Law School together. But by that yeah. time, I refused to room with him. Was that so, right? You yeah. wouldn't do it? <laughs> yeah. Anybody yeah. but Julian, that's yeah. how it went yeah. uh, but, yeah. but, you know, what's interesting is it, that competition, I think, can go in a, in, a, in a productive direction or it can go in a negative direction. And fortunately for us, it went in a positive direction. I hope politics and law. I don't know, but yeah. Uh, yeah. But yeah. okay. Last question, sir. Yes, this is for the both of you. Uh, what was that one moment when you guys were starting to become involved in politics that made you decide to run for that specific seat? And who was the first person you told, and what was the response you got right, from yeah. your when, family? When, when, did, when did this all come into flower? Um, well, you know, we grew up, or I grew up at least, I think Joaquin would agree with me, not liking politics because especially uh, my mother had dragged us to a whole bunch of different political events and so we just didn't, you know, didn't like it. It was boring. Yeah, we've been uh, at this since we were three, so yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're a little tired. Of <laughs> and, then, uh, and then it was when I went away, when we went away to Stanford, and we decided to run in the spring of 1995 for the student senate. And remember what had happened in November of 1994 uh, was, of course, Bush had gotten elected over here. Contract with America. The contract National with America. Right, also, yeah. they had run on television, ad television ads in California on Prop 187. Uh, anyway, um, and I had been a White House intern in the summer of 1994. So for me, so I saw that the student elections were coming up in the spring of 1995. And I went, I went to Joaquin and said, oh, you know, we should really run for the ASSU, the Stanford Student Senate. And uh, people will like it that we're twins and, you know, we can go campaign <laughs> together. And, uh, and then and I think that was the first time that we thought about actually, or I thought about actually running for something. Um, and you both ran. Yeah. yeah we, and that you was both our won? First. We tied for first place out of 43 candidates. Yeah. Yeah. Is that right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We got, we got 811 votes. Is that it? Yeah. I think the computer just didn't know there were two J cast. Right, that's it. <laughs> but we tied. This yeah. whole thing is a big mistake. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Right, all those years later. Yeah. But, but underlying that was that it was the first time that we were away from our hometown, and we got to see what was great about the city and also what needed real improvement. Over there in the Bay Area, you had a higher education level, higher income level. It was more innovative. San Antonio was lower income, less education, uh, and so forth. But San Antonio also, I felt, had more of a sense of community to it. Uh, I think a stronger place to raise a family just because it's a more cohesive big city. Uh, and in comparing those two, I got excited about, well, what could you do if you came back one day and tried to be a part of making it better? Kind of, kind of combining the best of the, both worlds of the Bay Area and, and San Antonio. Good. Well, we'll close it there. We're very fortunate to have had time with the mayor and the congressman. Please give them a hand. Thank you all for coming. Thanks a lot. Mark, thank you. Thanks to the library. We appreciate it.